We try to remember that medicine is for the patient. We try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It is not only for the prophets. The prophets follow. And if we have remembered that, they have never failed to appear. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, doc dear doctors and colleagues. My name is Carl, Dr. Carl Hanson. I am an infectious disease specialist and a member of FISMID. And I'm here to welcome you all to one of the um, lectures on uh, nosocomial pneumonia. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Huh? So our topic for this afternoon is evolving concepts in nosocomial pneumonia. And we are very thankful to uh, MSD for sponsoring this lecture. Specifically, our topics for this afternoon will be when and why should you consider bacterial pneumonia in the COVID patient, so very relevant to uh, the patient population that we see these days, and this will be by Dr. Solante, Ron, Jean Solante. And we're going to also have, hear a talk from uh, Dr. Marin Collett, um, whom I will introduce later on. And he will talk about updates in antimicrobial therapy for nosocomial pneumonia. Now, to introduce our speakers, uh, Dr. Ronjin Solante, we, um, for those in PISMID, we all know him. He is the chairman of the Adult Infectious Disease and Tropical Medicine Department in San Lazaro Hospital. He's also chairman of the Infectious Disease Section in UERM uh, Memorial Medical Center. Um, he is currently a, a board uh, member in the Philippine College of Physicians and works as the treasurer of that uh, college. And he is the past president of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. He is also currently a committee member of the Global Steering uh, of uh, Medscape Pneumococcal Disease Prevention and Education. And our next speaker, our second speaker, uh, is Dr. Marin Collis. He is a professor of medicine uh, and the Virginia E. and Sam J. Goldman Chair in Respiratory Intensive Care Medicine at the Washington University School of Medicine. He is also the director uh, of the crit Critical Care Research and director of the Respiratory Care Services at the Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, friends, let's all welcome our first speaker, Dr. Solante, to be followed by uh, Dr. Collis. 
So good afternoon. So the topic for this afternoon is uh, when and why should you consider bacterial pneumonia in the COVID-19 patient? So the topic will describe the burden of bacterial co-infections complicating patients with COVID-19 and will also review the empiric antibiotic treatment recommendations. Experts believe that the trial of SARS-CoV-2 presence of bacterial co-infections and the prevailing antimicrobial resistance form a deadly trial in the sense that uh, somehow necessitating uh, urgent clinical management, diagnosis, and correct antimicrobial. Most of them believe that with this deadly trial, it is also associated with higher risk of severity and higher risk of mortality. Let's take a look at how the interplay between SARS-CoV-2 virus, bacteria, and the host. When a patient has SARS-CoV-2 virus, the presence of your virulence factor will evoke an immune response in the lungs. And this immune response will compromise the innate immunity in the lungs at all levels, and at the same time, can also uncover bacterial receptors. This is what we call a virus-mediated enhancement of bacterial attachment, growth, and dissemination. And with this co-infection, it has been theorized that it can also cause exuberant inflammatory response. At the other end, the presence of your bacterial colonization can also influence viral survival, replication, and pathology. And that's why it can also lead to higher risk of transmission and acquisition of your SARS-CoV-2 infection. And because of the presence of this co-infection, co there will be more tissue damage amplified in a setting of a patient with already SARS-CoV-2 inflammation. Now, most of these experts believe that bacterial infection in COVID-19 should be defined. It can either be defined as the presence of bacteria during an acute infection with SARS-CoV-2 termed as co-infection, or the presence of a bacterial infection is the, the defined as a secondary infection, which usually emerge during the course of illness or hospital stay. One of the first living uh, review and meta-analysis that was able to define uh, the presence of bacterial co-infection in COVID-19 was published in July 22, 2020, where it included 24 studies for a total of 3,000 plus patients. In this particular review, the presence of bacterial co-infection was documented in 3.5%, but the presence of secondary infection after presentation or during uh, the hospital course of these patients was at least 14.3%. But despite these low numbers or percentage of bacterial co-infections, more than 70% of the physicians still prescribe antibiotics. And this is followed by another uh, review, uh, this time consisting of 38 studies, uh, including uh, 7,000 plus uh, COVID-19 patients started in December up to present. And there is a slight increase in the rate of bacterial co-infection on presentation at 4.9%. And this is followed by secondary infection after presentation around 16%. And it seemed logical that based on uh, big studies that bacterial co-infection is relatively infrequent in most patients hospitalized with COVID-19. But still, the majority of these patients receive an antibiotic. Another study that was able to uh, elucidate the importance of bacterial co-infection based on the onset of infection 4.6% and secondary infection, 16%. And most of these patients, especially those in the ICU, develop secondary bacterial infection in 16% of the time. Again, another systematic review and meta-analysis, this time around 30 studies in 3,824 patients that were enrolled. Bacterial co-infection was documented in 7%. And most of this uh, are usually in the ICU that are critically ill. And these are the pathogens that were detected among this uh, study, majority of which 
secondary to your mycoplasma pneumoniae. And the other group of microorganisms here are usually the gram negatives. And we presume that these are also the microorganisms isolated during the development of secondary infection during this, the course of the uh, COVID-19. We're going to review the WHO recommendation in terms of the role of antimicrobial. The WHO only recommends the use of antimicrobial among patients who develop severe COVID-19, clinical judgment, patient host factors, and of course, the importance of local epidemiology and antibody drugs. Ideally, it should be given as soon as possible within an hour because of a higher risk of mortality. And at the same time, since it's very difficult out the absence of bacterial co-infection, which can also increase the risk of mortality, but you need to give an antibiotic as soon as possible. Here, you need to de-escalate your antimicrobial once the patient uh, has improved, and also based on clinical studies. In our own guideline, the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, the Philippine College of Chest Physicians, in the interim guidance on the clinical management of adult patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Our antibiotic is usually or mainly given by the Philippine Community Acquired Pneumonia Guidelines. And this is uh, based on the possibility of a co-infection during admission, especially for those patients with moderate to high risk and severe form of COVID. Although the patient may be suspected to have COVID-19, still very important to administer appropriate empiric antimicrobials within one hour of identification that the patient is sending. And again, and it's very important to also streamline antimicrobial treatment soon as microbiologic study results become available. So during the early days of pandemic, most of the patients that are admitted because of COVID-19, the fact that uh, it's difficult to rule out presence of uh, uh, bacterial co-infection, thus most of us are giving empiric antibiotic. But because of this new data, it seemed that the importance of differentiating co-infection from secondary infection is also, uh, should be emphasized in order for us to be guided to really give an antibiotic or not. Otherwise, we might be able to proliferate problem of antimicrobial resistance. If we're, going down, if we're going to break down the identified COVID-19 and the spectrum of clinical interventions, options, that focusing on breathing support, it will look like this. Most of these patients, upon admitted, will have a mild diagnosis and basically will not need oxygen therapy. But in some 5 to 15% of cases, these patients will have moderate cases of COVID-19 and in some patient, patients, 5% will have critical uh, stage of the infection, and that's where they need mechanical ventilation. And in this setting, this is also where the risk of secondary infection is higher because of the presence of your mechanical ventilation. A study that was able to define the presence of bacterial pneumonia among COVID-19 in critically ill patients based on a case series found out that among those patients who develop early onset, late onset pap, most of the organisms here are secondary to your E. coli, including those of non-fermenting bacteria, specifically Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia. And among these patients, the ICU mortality is 30%. And among those patients who develop ARDS, the mortality is 100%. And among patients that are critically ill and who are mechanically ventilated, they also are associated with longer hospital stay in the ICU, aside from a higher rate of mortality. We're going to look at the impact of these microorganisms that are in patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia. Every possibility that uh, most of these patients will have multidrug resistant pathogens. Again, 60% of these patients are also associated with higher risk of mortality. Because of that, some of these guidelines recommend that if a patient will develop a secondary pneumonia during this COVID pandemic and are on invasive mechanical ventilation, 
then this warrants aggressive use of the broad spectrum antibiotic with coverage for the calloway, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and possibly other multi drug resistant organisms. In one treatment algorithm that was proposed by some of this Italian group in terms of managing patients with COVID-19, developing severe pneumonia, they also stratify and identify that patients should be uh, stratified according to risk for the presence of thicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So they put it as the absence of these risk factors they will be considered as low risk for Pseudomonas aeruginosa and MRSA. And these are the antibiotic that will be given. But if patients will have risks for Pseudomonas aeruginosa and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus that are in this particular uh, boxes, okay, then this warrants administration or combination of uh, MRSA antibiotic and that of an antibiotic that is also active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But if the patient have previous history or in a setting where you have high prevalence of MDR or XDR Pseudomonas aeruginosa or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae infection, then consideration should also be uh, very important using new drugs such as ceftolozane tazibactam or meropenem vaporbactam plus or without aminoglycoside or phosphomycin or tigacycline. And that's the reason why that uh, prevention is really better than treating a patient with ventilator associated pneumonia. That's what, that's what also, and that is what also emphasized in most of our clinical guidelines on how to reduce the incidence of ventilator associated uh, pneumonia because of the risks of higher mortality and severe course. So in conclusion, bacterial infection may occur in any stage of COVID-19 infection. Although it's relatively infrequent in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, yet most of us are giving empiric antibacterial treatment among these patients because it's very difficult to rule out the presence or the absence of a co-infection. And that's why understanding the proportion of this respiratory bacterial pathogens in patients with COVID-19 will play a significant impact in refining empiric antibiotic management guideline in order to prevent antimicrobial resistance. Secondary bacterial infections usually present later in COVID-19 may involve multidrug resistant pathogens thus warrants the aggressive use of empiric broad spectrum coverage for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus Pseudomonas aeruginosa and multi-drug resistant organism. Thank you. Well, hello. Uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation really on the topic of updates in antimicrobial therapy for nosocomial pneumonia. My name is Marin Kahlo. I'm a professor of medicine at Washington University in St. Louis where I'm the Director of Respiratory Care Services and the Director of Critical Care Research at Barnes-Jewish Hospital. So I'll start out with a case here, and the case is of a 60-year-old man who has renal cell carcinoma uh, and developed COVID-19 infection. I'll show this since we're obviously in the midst of a COVID outbreak. Uh, this gentleman, uh, see back in April, uh, was in our hospital he came in with COVID-19, and about one week later, he developed new infiltrates, primarily on the left, had worsening fever and leukocytosis, and a sputum grew greater than 10 to the fifth colony units per mil of carbapenem-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So again, even recognize that in COVID-19 patients, probably less than 10% of them develop a pulmonary superinfection. They can occur and they can frequently be caused by more antibiotic resistant pathogens. I'm going to go over the prophetic study, which we're involved with as well. The reference is down below by Bergen and Chess 2020. The prophetic study was a prospective cohort study involving 28 hospitals in the United States. 
examining individuals within the intensive care units. It included individuals that were hospitalized for more than 48 hours and considered at high risk for pneumonia. High risk for pneumonia was defined as treatment with invasive or non-invasive ventilatory support or high levels of supplemental oxygen. And the goal of the prophetic study was to identify key patient characteristics and treatment exposures associated with the development of nosocomial pneumonia. Keep in mind that this study was done prior to a current outbreak of COVID. Next study, as you can see here, we identified more than 4,600 high-risk patients in the intensive care unit setting. What was interesting was that about a third of them, 1,464, were treated for pneumonia. However, only 537 of those patients, about a third of those treated, they met the clinical criteria for pneumonia as were defined in our study. So what this tells us, and we, we knew this anecdotally, is that there are many patients in the ICU setting who get treated with antibiotics for pneumonia, but probably do not have it. So on the one hand, we have a stewardship opportunity there. It's also important to recognize patients that meet the clinical criteria for pneumonia, the breakdown in the ICU was at about three quarters of them, 394 had ventilator associated pneumonia and 143 had hospital acquired bacterial pneumonia. When we look at the breakdown of the pathogens associated with the prophetic study, and obviously these are US data, you would want to be familiar with your own local data in the Philippines, but in the data that we have, what we showed was that about 40% of patients have no organism identified. And that has been a fairly consistent literature, somewhere between 30 and 40%. Both hospital and associated bacterial pneumonia had similar distributions of pathogens. You can see here that the most common pathogens when we look at a single organism were Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The Enterobacteriaceae as a group were common, making up uh, somewhere around 20 to 25 percent. But within the Enterobacteriaceae, Klebsiella was most common, followed by Enterobacter, E. coli, and serration. So this gives us a breakdown of the organisms associated with nosocomial pneumonia, the ICUs in the U.S., and this is pretty similar throughout the world. We're primarily talking about aerobic gram-negative organisms with non-fermenters like Pseudomonas being quite common. In other parts of the world, Acinetobacter would also be an important player, and Staph aureus. So understanding your local pathogens is really critical. In the prophetic study, we also showed, and we're focusing on the red line here in the graph, that the median duration of mechanical ventilation for patients developing ventilator-associated pneumonia was about eight days or one week, and that's similar to prior studies. So it gives us an idea on when these ventilator-associated pneumonias are occurring. For patients with hospital-acquired pneumonia, as you can see, most of these were patients who had their pneumonia occur almost at the time that they were admitted to the ICU because they generally were transferred from the hospital floor to the ICU. So these were pneumonias that were occurring at the time of transfer or within a day or two of transfer. We also very importantly examined risk factors for developing nosocomial pneumonia in the intensive care unit. Many of these previously, including trauma, the use of enteral nutrition, patients with an aspiration risk, and very importantly, having received systemic antibiotics in the prior 90 days. Our group also showed that as an important risk factor more than 20 years ago in a paper that we published in JAMA. So having prior antibiotic exposure predisposes to colonization and infection more antibiotic-resistant organisms. And there are obviously other risk factors as well. Very briefly, I'm going to go over the EPIC-3 study. Our hospital also participated in EPIC-3, which was a global one-day prevalence study of infections in the ICU. And you can see the distribution of countries here. 
The prophetic study and EPIC-3, as shown on this graph, highlight the importance of respiratory infections. EPIC-3 showed that respiratory infections were the most common infection that we deal with in the intensive care unit setting, by far, accounting for essentially 60% of all infections. And if you look at the gray bars on the right, most of those were nosocomial infections, either coming from the hospital or healthcare acquired, occurring within the ICU. So again, we're concerned about potentially antibiotics and organisms. And EPIC-3 also showed that if you're infected with a more antibiotic resistant organism, your likelihood for mortality is higher. And that likely occurs because of delays in the administration of a initial antibiotic therapy. So it's critical to understand pathogens are and their susceptibilities that cause pneumonia in your intensive unit setting. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I think everyone's familiar with it. We all know about community acquired pneumonia. We know about hospital acquired pneumonia. It's something that occurs typically more than 48 hours after hospital admission. And within that group, hospital acquired pneumonias that subsequently need mechanical ventilation. We call those ventilated HAP patients. What's somewhat controversial is this idea of healthcare associated pneumonia, meaning there are patients outside the hospital that have exposure to the healthcare system from nursing homes, from immune suppression, from chemotherapy, from organ transplants, and then they come into the hospital. And they're also at higher risk for infections with more antibiotic resistant organisms. And we also have VAP, which we've talked about. In our hospital, we published a case control study several years ago looking at patients with hospital-acquired pneumonia in the control group, and we matched them with controls who were matched on severity of illness who did not develop hospital-acquired pneumonia. And you can see that the occurrence of hospital-acquired pneumonia is associated with a greater need for ICU transfer, the need for mechanical ventilation, it has a higher mortality associated with it. The lengths of stay are significantly long, and readmission rates are higher as well. And in a multivariate analysis, developing a hospital-acquired pneumonia was an independent predictor for mortality. But if you required mechanical ventilation on top of that, the mortality risk increased even greater. So ventilated HAP, ventilated hospital-acquired pneumonia, becomes a significant problem with a very high mortality. And we see from this graph illustrating for us the breakdown of nosocomial pneumonia that we have patients with hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-associated pneumonia. And we talked about those in the prophetic study. In hospital-acquired pneumonia, we have the non-ventilated patients who are either on the hospital floors or in the ICU. And then we have the ventilator HAP patients. For VAP, some people still use the terms early and late, although now we know that those probably are very similar in terms of organism distribution, so we often combine them. When we look at the mortalities, and these are data from Talbot's study, which is really a consortium looking at biomarkers for patients with pneumonia, what we see is that the pneumonia mortality in non-ventilated HAP is about 14.5%. For ventilated HAP, it's almost 28%. And for VAP, it's about 18%. So all cause mortality is highest in ventilated HAP. And there probably are a number of reasons for that, some of which probably have to do with delays in getting effective antibiotic therapy on board. Other studies support this. Again, uh, this is a study uh, which was a longitudinal prospective study of over 14,000 patients in ICUs. Uh, about 7,700 were at risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia. About 9,700 patients were at risk for non-ventilator ICU hospital-acquired pneumonia. The point of this study is that when you look at the increase in third mortality, Patients who develop VAP had about a 38% increased risk. Patients who had non-ventilated ICU HAP who developed pneumonia 
had about an 80% increase. So again, we're seeing that from a relative standpoint, the mortality increases seem to be higher in patients with hospital-acquired pneumonia, particularly if they go on and subsequently become ventilated. And this is summarized in a nice review paper by Zaragoza and colleagues, looking at progression of disease. And what you can see here is on the hospital floor, as you go from HAP to HAP that is not treated appropriately, the disease progresses, mortality risk increases. The same occurs in the ICU as you go from non-ventilated ICU pneumonia to VAP and ventilated HAP. Where ventilated HAP, because of progression of the disease and potentially delays in getting appropriate therapy on board, carries the highest mortality. Now, the guidelines have offered some recommendations for therapy. These are U.S. guidelines, and again, I would suggest that in the Philippines, you would also be familiar with your local guidelines. But in the IDSA ATS guidelines published in 2005, the recommendations were pretty straightforward. They recommended giving an antibiotic that typically would cover pseudomonas, like an antimonal cephalosporin, cefepime, ceftazidine, or an anti-pseudomonal penem, imipenem, meripenem, or a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, tiprosilatazobactam, and combining it with a second agent, either a fluoroquinolone, aminoglycoside, and then adding an agent to cover for MRSA, if you have MRSA in your area. There are some problems with recommendation. The problem is that when you add a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside to your base antibiotic, the problem with the fluoroquinolones are they generally don't add much activity. And in many centers like my own, you don't gain anything by adding the fluoroquinolone other than potentially increasing resistance. And the problem with the aminoglycoside, they're administered IV, you don't get lung penetration. Unfortunately, we've had two randomized trials published recently demonstrating that inhaled aminoglycosides as well probably don't have much activity. So there are flaws with this recommendation. The new IDSA ATS guidelines that came out in 2016 were very similar in their recommendations as shown in this table, except now they also include Trianam as an option and they include the polymyxins. What I will tell you about the polymyxins are that we really don't have great data suggesting that they're effective agents. They don't penetrate well into the lung. They carry significant nephrotoxicity when they're used. And the other problem is that more recent data has really cast doubt on their efficacy. So you can almost think of this as somewhat of an act of desperation by including them within the guideline. The European guidelines take a little bit of a different approach to this. And these were published in 2017, and I participated in the guideline. They suggest that if you have patients with suspected hospital or ventilator stated pneumonia, you should assess their risk for both mortality and the presence of an MDR organism. Mortality is stratified a quarter breakpoint of 15% based on a study that was done by Anand Kumar suggesting that if you have a mortality less than 15%, you can get treated with monotherapy. What you can see from the recommendation is that if you assess the patient as being at low risk for mortality and at low risk for having an MDR organism, then monotherapy based on your local susceptibilities is probably okay. And options include agents like vertipenem, ceftriaxone, et cetera but again, based on your local antibiogram. On the other hand, if your patient is at high risk for mortality, meaning greater than 15%, and or at high risk for having an MDR pathogen, then you need to examine them. Septic shock, you can probably get by with a single gram-negative agent as long as that agent has greater than 90% activity for the gram-negatives in your ICU. If not, then you need to consider one of the newer agents that will about or some type of combination spectrum, and then consider MRSA activity. 
On the other hand, if your patient does have septic shock, then you do need to consider either dual therapy with gram-negative agents, or if dual coverage be appropriate in terms of covering more than 90% of the isolates, you need to think of newer agents and or consider you know, some other approach, and then also consider MRSA. The next update to the guideline that I'm going to show you by Zaragoza published in 2020 really makes a lot of sense because it incorporates the newer agents. And in this particular update, one has to take into account whether or not you're dealing with someone who's at low risk for an MDR, you know, maybe a very early onset pneumonia without risk factors, in which case something like a third generation cephalosporin would be appropriate. On the other hand, if you have ventilated HAP or prior antibiotic therapy and it's failing, you need to be concerned about an antibiotic resistant organism. And if you have ventilator associated pneumonia, you clearly need to be concerned about more resistant organisms based on your local resistance patterns. And as you can see here, this guideline update takes into account the newer agents based on what you see within your intensive care unit. You're seeing Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's MDR. The recommendation would be with, for septolazone tazobactam, possibly with an aminoglycoside or fluoroquinolone if your goal is to try to mitigate resistance emergence. If your problem is more on the side of KPCs, then septazidine abibactam plus or minus I mean, a glycoside or quinolone might be a more appropriate approach. And then if it's unknown, one can consider alternatives, especially if you don't know what your risk of MDR is or if you think it's at the lower level. You also need to think about definitive antimicrobial is listed at the bottom there. And again, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, one will of Telosontazobactam at the higher dosing, the three gram dosing every eight hours. For KPC or OXA48 infections, septazidine so maybe Bactam. For the metallobetalactamases, one can consider using septazidine so AV Bactam, combination with estrianam, or possibly adding colistin, or even going to septic. And for acinetobacter, again, one can consider colistin or cefidericol. Cefidericol possibly being a better choice there. Going on to the next slide now, we're going to discuss some of the newer agents available to us. These are beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations for nosocomial pneumonia. And really the three that we have in the U.S. that have received the most attention are listed here. Septazidine, maybe Bactam, which is the third generation cephalosporin, plus a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor. It's dosed at half grams, Q8 hours for 7 to 14 days. We already mentioned from the Zaragoza document. This might be something uh, that would be more reserved for KP. Septolazone tazobactam is a novel cephalosporin plus an established beta-lactamase inhibitor. This is dosed at a higher level at 3 grams Q8 hours for 8 to 14 days. And again, this is a drug that we use uh, preferentially for our pseudomonas infections in our hospital setting. And then we have imipicillostatin relabactam which is a carbapenem plus a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor dosed at 500, 500, 250 every six hours for four to 14 days. And again, this has broad spectrum of activity for both pseudomonas as well as for the KPCs. When thinking about using antibiotics, but in particular the newer agents, we have to take into account their efficacy. So we're trying to decrease mortality, prevent organ dysfunction, and reduce length of stay. So going back to the Zaragoza document, if you're worried about a high-risk organism like Sucrose, one can consider one of the newer agents. But at the same time, stage two has to do with de-escalation and focusing on the ecology. So that anytime you're using antibiotics, you need to review the microbiology. If the microbiology suggests that you can de-escalate to a lower agent that should occur, not only to minimize costs, but to prevent 
the emergence of further resistance. Let's look at the NP study. I happen to be the uh, lead investigator for this study. This was the registration trial comparing septolazone tazobactam to mirapan for the indication of pneumonia. And keep in mind, this was dosed at the three gram dosing. What you can see here that in this registration trial, which was done approval for the drug for the indication of nosocomial pneumonia in both the US and Europe, non-inferiority was achieved. So these registration trials are designed to achieve non-inferiority, and that was true across the board for the VAP patients and for the ventilated HAP patients. In fact, for the ventilated HAP patients, it appeared the tolazone tazobactam did better from a clinical cure standpoint. When we look at all cause 28 day mortality, again, one can see here that non inferiority was achieved. But strikingly, when you look at the mid HAP population, the mortality was significantly higher who were treated with meropenem compared to septolazone tazobactam. So, again, suggesting that within that subgroup, there's some beneficial response of treating the patients with a drug like septolazone tazobactam, possibly again with the fact that inadequate initial treatments were administered to those patients and now receiving more effective therapy. So, it's a subgroup analysis, but it's a very interesting subgroup. When we look at the Caterpillar plot from that study, again, two striking things emerge. In the subgroup of patients that ventilated hospital-acquired mortality, or hospital-acquired pneumonia, I should say, the overall outcomes from a mortality perspective were better in the patients who received septolazone tazobactam. And along the same lines, patients who were unsuccessfully treated with antibacterial therapy also did better if they receive septolazone tazobactam versus meropenem. So those were two subgroup analyses from the study. When we look at in the ASPECT NP study, again, septolazone tazobactam did equally as well as meropenem across all organist subtypes. Now, I'm going to present a couple of sub analyses from the ASPECT NP study. The first is in preparation by Jean Francois Timset. And this was essentially an analysis of the ventilated HAP population. We wanted to do this analysis to better understand why there was a mortality difference within that arm. And in the multivariable analysis, and again, this is a manuscript that's in preparation, one can see that the factors that were associated with a difference in 28 day mortality are shown here bacteremia, the use of vasopressors, increasing age, and assignment to the marrow. So, again, despite all these other factors being controlled for, treatment with septolazone tazobactam was associated with a better outcome in this subgroup analysis. And the final subgroup analysis that we're going to look at really has to do with healthcare utilization as by Tom Lodes in infectious disease therapy recently. And what Tom did in this study was again to compare the patients in the MITT population and the healthcare resource utilization population, individuals that were actually discharged from the hospital. And when you tell us on tazobactam and meropenem, the striking findings are that healthcare utilization, when you look at it from the perspective of hospital length of stay and ICU length of stay, were longer in patients who were treated with meropenem. So again, suggesting that one can make a cost-effective analysis argument in favor of using septolazone tazobactam. I'm going to summarize the discussion by saying that all clinicians managing patients with hospital and ventilator-associated bacterial pneumonia should be aware of the local pathogen 
in their hospitals and in their intensive care units, as well as their susceptibility patterns to really help to guide both empiric and directed antimicrobial therapy. That's gonna be key for empiric therapy. Early pathogen-specific antibiotic therapy results in improved outcomes, including lower mortality. And we know that if we administer appropriate initial therapy that's active against the organism, the outcomes will be better. And having a multidisciplinary approach is a in ensuring optimal management approaches and achieving a favorable patient outcome. Thank you very much for listening. Ako moderator. Sa MSD, ako moderator. Hello everyone, good evening. Um, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Um, unfortunately, uh, so we're, we're going to open our uh, section on questions and answers. Unfortunately, Dr. Kolev is not here to join us. So our questions will be uh, answered by our first speaker, Dr. Gene Solante. Uh, can we have him? All right. Hi, sir. Good evening. Po. Hi, Carl. How are you? Okay, naman, sir. I'm at the Atacomad Center. No? And uh, first of all, we'd like to thank uh, MSD for... Uh, for uh, partnering with us in this endeavor. But um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start with uh, some questions from my own list. Um, sir, you, how, how do you navigate now given, um, especially in the light of um, COVID-19 no? and we know how Patients stay on ventilators for a long time, um, and um, they 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 usually get multidrug resistant organisms. No, so can you tell us a bit of uh, your own process for determining a good empiric regimen for these patients? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Carl, for that uh, question. But but first, we'll have to I think apply that that uh, Zaragoza principle on how they look at. Uh, a, an, an ordinary HAP and then developing into a VHAP where progression is really very high and mortality is also uh, really high. I think that, that speaks well of most of our patients because uh, as they go stay in the, in the ICU, initially not, not ventilated, and uh, we, we are already giving onboard antibiotics like a third generation or a piperacillin tazobactam or, or worse, some of some of these are already started on carbapenem. And once they will be intubated, and then the, uh, the next question then is, I have given my fourth generation cephalosporin or piperacillin tazobactam, and what's next? And then most of us will, will uh, change to shift to a higher spectrum like a carbapenem. But again, if, if that will be a failure, some, something like our, our threshold for changing like 48 hours, the patient will not respond, then we'll change to either uh, a carbapenem, carbapenemase active uh, agent or, or a porine uh, stable uh, active agent against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I think that's what, what I'm seeing now, the way we use antibiotics in most of our patients with COVID-19. And uh, uh, it, it's really very tough because uh, at times when we factor in also our own local uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance pattern in the ICU, like you have there in TMC, in San Lazaro, or in any other private hospitals, we seem uh, to really be more on giving the most, the broadest and the least and the most active among these agents, given that window period that these patients will also have a really high mortality because not only because of bacterial, possible bacterial co-infection, but also because of the hyperinflammatory state. All right, thank you, sir, for that question. 
Um, before I move on to my own second question, there's a question from the chat box. Uh, this is Dr. Faith Villanueva. Uh, can you tell us now the status of the local HAPVAP guidelines? Uh, is there one um, that's, that's, that's being prepared? Maybe you before I comment. <laughs> as, as far as I can remember, I think uh, PSMID in collaboration with, I think with uh, PCCP and FIX, they're, 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 doing, they're going to do that. I think Dr. Pandaligan was the one in, in charge of that. I, I don't know what's the mm -hmm. status then of our local uh, uh, guideline. Right. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, you know, if we will work on this next year, um, but we can, we, I can take a look. Um, I do know that we, we are getting some very new data. Um, for example, Dr. Uh, Dr. Celia Carlos actually just published a paper on uh, the molecular uh, epidemiology of our own isolates. Uh, this was very, very recently published, and this is data from, you know, decade, well, 2013 to 2014 yata na, na isolates from ARSP, no? and the, the results are very interesting. So uh, this is a Nature Communications article, and, and I invite you to review the findings there. And it actually should also help us to determine how we how we give our empiric regimens especially you know if we know that our hospitals have um, a lot of multidrug resistant organisms and i guess sir in in the in your answer we need to emphasize you know, knowing their own microbiology in their hospitals because that will really help us and he'll help them to um to determine what the best empiric regimen is. Now, um, I believe we have maybe time for one more question. Um, now we've talked about empiric therapy. Uh, I guess I, I'd like to know your comments, sir, uh, if, you, if you do have some on, there's a new 2020 IDSA guideline um, where actually ceftolazine tazobactam and ceftazidine avibactam they're highlighted in this in this guideline no? and in previous iterations of uh, the IDSA guidelines medyo parang on the periphery pa sila hindi pa sila central so can you comment on on this guideline sir yeah thank you carl i think if you look at the new IDSA guideline on mdr gram negative they put more focus now on the role of ceftolozane tazobactam against Pseudomonas erogenosa. And I think they, they in fact rank the, 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 these uh, new antimicrobials against Pseudomonas. Number one is that if you, if you want to really cover for the most potent against uh, Pseudomonas erogenosa, even with this current resistance phenotype uh, prevailing, uh, first is ceftolozane tazobactam. And then after that is ceftazidim avibactam. I think one of the reasons given there, if you look at the, the, the fine prints in that article, is that the, the common knowledge and prevailing mechanism of drug resistance for pseudomonas is still the efflux and the porin. So that, there's an advantage there over that of uh, 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 ceftazidim avibactam. But for the, the KPC, I think it's... it's, it's uh, it's something that it's the domain now of your ceftazidim uh, uh, avibactam. And then for the MBL, it's a combination of your ceftazidim avibactam, though it doesn't have activity against the MBL, but it should be combined with your uh, astrinum. Astrinum, right. Yeah, that's great, sir. Um, I agree with those, uh, uh, those options. No. And actually that, that, that guideline is very helpful, but they do emphasize that uh, it's designed to be for pathogen-directed uh, recommendations. Now, you cannot use those recommendations if you don't know your bug yet. So yeah. when we do empiric therapy, you need to know local microbiology and your resistance patterns. And then once you know your uh, resistance patterns or you know your bug and the mechanism behind it or the possible mechanism, then you will be able to determine pathogen-directed therapy. 
All right. I, I guess that's all the time that we have. Um, to give us some some uh, words from our 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 partners in MSD, no? some closing remarks. May I call on um, Doctor Doctor Maan? Wait, the let send you that. Dr. Maan Galang Escalon, I apologize for that. The MSD Philippines Country Medical Lead had to give us some words of, 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 uh, of closing. Yes. So good afternoon. Thank you for that, Dr. Henson. And um, good afternoon to our speakers, Dr. Kolef, Dr. Solante, and to our moderator, Dr. Henson. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our um, symposium this afternoon. It is MSD's pleasure to be sharing with you relevant updates and evolving concepts on nosocomial pneumonia. We are in an age wherein we need to constantly adapt to the challenges in healthcare. As physicians, we are stewards guarding the fronts of antimicrobial resistance. We always need to arm ourselves with the latest concepts to address the needs of our patients. As your partners in healthcare, MSD will remain cognizant of this need to help you all stay updated and stay focused in helping our patients. Congratulations and thank you to our speakers and our moderator. Congratulations to PISMID on your 50th year. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Dr. Maan. Um, now let me, let me give my own closing remarks and this is in behalf of uh, PSMID. No? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kolev. Thank you, Dr. Solante, for those uh, th those very informative lectures. And uh, on behalf of the board of the PSMID, I would like to thank MSD for partnering with us in mounting the 40, 42nd annual convention. We felt that the scientific lessons we will impart in this convention needs to be communicated now more than ever. Uh, and your partnership in this endeavor really did help to make this happen. We shall be sending certificates of appreciation for our speakers and for MSD by email. I'd like to thank you all, our attendees, for, for coming to this afternoon's lecture. And we look forward to seeing you in the main scientific sessions that will follow immediately this event. Please do not forget that you need to log out or leave this Zoom webinar room. And you need to go back to the convention website and click on the Zoom link for the evening, se uh, evening session Zoom links. No? Um, so you need to go back to uh, the, the PISMID virtual 2020.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, MSD. And I do hope that you have a pleasant evening.